All right, welcome to another episode of Curious Christianity. If you've ever wondered about if you should be a Christian, even if you don't believe it, well, I have uh, Randall Rouser here who has just published a book and is gonna help explain this for us. So um, Randall, uh, welcome to the channel. Thanks for having me, Adam. Good to be here. Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I must totally admit, man, your title for this book was absolutely clickbaity to me. Um, so I'm curious, number one, yeah, if you could tell us a little bit. So why did you decide to write this book? So the, the book title is The Doubter's Creed, and the subtitle is How to Be a Christian When You Don't Believe It's True. Very thought-provoking. Uh, yeah, why I why I wrote it is because uh, well, I'm a professor. I've, I've been at teaching here at Taylor Seminary in Edmonton, Canada for close to 20 years now. And as a result, I end up hearing from a lot of people who have questions and who have doubts and who are skeptics. And very broadly speaking, I've encountered two groups in particular uh, that I think are relevant for this conversation. And the first group are people that I would call Christian doubters. And there okay. are many. So those are people who they identify as a Christian, they're part of a Christian community, they are, they believe perhaps some of the Christian doctrines, but they nonetheless have some serious doubts or questions, or in some cases even disbelief in one or more doctrines. But their framework is to understand that they are a Christian and they want to be a Christian. The other group are people who are not themselves Christians, but they would like Christianity to be true. Mm -hmm. And they would like to identify as a Christian, but they just find themselves stumbling on the creeds, on the doctrines that define Christian belief. And so I call that group sympathetic disbelievers. So there's Christian doubters and there's mm -hmm. sympathetic disbelievers, and they're somewhat different, but they do share uh, the same problem. And that problem is that they stumble on assenting to one or more of the confessions, major confessions of Christian mm -hmm. creeds. And Christianity is, as I begin to say in the book, a uniquely creedal uh, religion. Um, in contrast to other religions, let, let's say um, Islam, you have the four pillars of Islam, where Judaism is founded on hero Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one. And those are the central unifying doctrinal claims, confessional claims of those traditions. For Christianity, it has been producing creeds for the better part of 2,000 years now, and they include a diverse array of, of beliefs that a person is supposed to accept as a Christian, whether it be the doctrine of the Trinity, the fall, incarnation, atonement, resurrection, ascension, second coming, final judgment, and on and on and on. And so it's not surprising that people may want to be a Christian and yet find they're stumbling on one or more of those doctrines. I wrote the book for those people. You know, um, I will, I will say I, I really love the way you put that out because I mean I've definitely seen so many other Christians struggle with similar things right where it's it's really just this intellectual barrier between let's just say a very difficult doctrine of the Trinity or something like that and they're like it's like I mean I like Jesus I like these aspects but yeah they're wrestling it's kind of those that are intellectually wrestling with some of these creedal doctrines Does that sound right yeah very much so. Yeah, I mean, I've even had like my own friends, you know, express their own concerns. And I, I would definitely say that I wrestled a lot with those things when I was younger, you know, and especially for those that are deeply steeped in apologetics and for some that that end up in that middle struggling point where they're studying a lot, but then at some point they hit a roadblock. So this is kind of to help bring those in a little closer and overcome some of those barriers. Does that sound right? Yeah, you bet. Great, great. So... I am curious. So you deal with both of these parties in different ways then? Uh, not or do you... really. I, okay. I think that, that they're, they're, I mean, they're, they're somewhat different in their starting point. Uh, and there will be some relevant differences later on. So um, later on in the book, I get to a point where I'm talking about people, like one way to find your way into Christianity is to participate in the life of the church. So this is mm -hmm. a very practical observation, but if, if you want to believe Christianity is true, then get into a healthy Christian community and participate within it. And it is at that point that there is a significant difference potentially between the sympathetic disbeliever and the Christian doubter, because if you're a Christian doubter, then you may already 
probably certainly if you're in a believers or sorry in, in an infant baptist tradition you're already baptized you may already be baptized as well as a believer and so you already have the rate of initiation that allows in most of christian communions for a further participation let's say in terms of participating in the communal elements of the church mm -hmm. uh membership or something else whereas if you're a disbeliever and you're you i'm saying come to church you may not have been baptized already mm -hmm. and you may not have then had the right of initiation to participate in the deeper life of the church so there would be some differences like that uh but for the most part the kind of advice and direction i'm giving applies to both groups equally gotcha gotcha so I, I am a little curious. Um, do you have like independent stories um, from some of these from some of these individuals and how they've kind of wrestled with this? Or um, so do do people usually who are for those that are sympathetic, are they interested in participating in parts of the church, or how does that usually work itself out? Like the book is not written for people who think Christianity is absurd or for people who are just uninterested in Christianity okay. or for people who actively do not want it to be true. So like, let's say you're hard atheists, right? Yeah. Well, I'm not trying to win over those people in this right, book. Right, right. I mean, I've written other books that aim to take on that audience. Sure, sure. But, but in this book, so these are people... Uh, who, are, who are already at that point of, look, this is as far as I can go but I just can't believe this. I, I want it to be true, but I can't believe that it is true. And this is one of the things that we find when it comes to belief, that belief is not an act of will. Now, there are many things that are acts of will. For example, uh -huh. you have the ability to raise your hand when you want to, right? Unless you're physically incapacitated or paralyzed. Uh, other than that, you can, you know, if I want to raise my hand to make an illustration, I can do so. I can will that my hand rise in the air but I cannot will to believe something. So for example, I cannot will the, to believe that I'm currently home having breakfast because I'm experiencing overwhelming sensory data that I'm talking to Adam on my um, computer. And so I can't change my belief there, even if I wanted to, even if a person said, hey, here's a million dollars for you to believe right now that you're home eating cereal. I can't do that. I don't have that power. And it can be really existentially disconcerting for a person who wants to believe Christianity, but just cannot. Mm -hmm. Then they're like, I, here's an illustration. Imagine that, that uh, you, um, you're in a room and the queen or, okay, the king now the queen <laughs> passed on the yeah. king walks into the room and everybody's supposed to rise. Uh, but let's say in that moment, you find that uh, your legs give out and you cannot stand and everybody's looking at you like, why don't you stand? And you're like, I want to stand, but I'm unable to. Right. That's the kind of situation a person finds himself in. I want to believe this, but I can't. What do I do? And so I wrote the book for those people. So uh, I guess what it reminds me of, it reminds me of that one story in the New Testament where the guy is basically like, you know, hey, Jesus, I want to believe, help my unbelief. Right. So it's somebody he desires to believe. He wants to believe. He wants to follow. And, and so in a sense, this is kind of helping them take that next step. It's trying to help them overcome the intellectual barriers to take that next step towards Christ. And so then you would say that, mm, I guess you could say by, I'll use an old kind of expression, and I don't mean this in a rigid sense, but kind of fake it till you make it, right? So if you kind of live the Christian life, if you kind of get your step or get your foot into the door, you have church community, you perhaps pray, read the Bible and stuff like that, that that will help you in the process or? That's all part of it. But uh, so what I want to do, when, and I, I do refer to that pericope, the story of, of the man who is desperate for the healing of his child. Mm -hmm. And then he cries out to Jesus, I believe, help my unbelief, which of course, in and of itself is a conflicted statement. Uh, you're confessing belief, even as you admit you don't yet have it. Right. And so that does show that desire to acquire belief. So that that is, I think, a very relevant illustration. Uh, now, fake it till you make it, uh, that in some contexts or spheres, that would have a negative connotation. Right. But uh, it can sort of be like, for example, the, the salesperson who hasn't achieved their level of success in life, well, they fake it till they make it, like act like you're more successful than you are. And that can be intellectually disingenuous. So I get there's this baggage to the illustration, to the, to the expression. But there's also a sense where that is true, that um, 
part of becoming a Christian is identifying with the Christian community. And see, this is where we come to what I, one of the things I want to challenge in the book is this assumption that you have to have all these beliefs before you can join in the life of the church. Mm -hmm. And I point out by writing different creeds. So I, I identify different groups. I, I talk about one group, I call them naturalists, people who believe nature is all that exists. And I said, look, even if you believe nature is all that exists, but you would like to be a Christian and identify more closely with Christianity, here's what you can believe in terms of from Christianity. And I give them a creed and say, you can start to live into that creed, which is centered on the love of neighbor. And I submit that if any Christian can master the love of neighbor in this life, you're doing better than 99.9999999% of the rest of us. So just focusing on beginning to love your neighbor as yourself is an extraordinary task and commitment. And it's something you can do now as a naturalist who wants to be more closely identified with Christianity. And then I go on from there and talk about people who are atheists, but who are not naturalists. And then people who are just sort of chronic doubters. And I give them creeds as well to show how they can begin to say, hey, this is what I can do. This is what I do currently believe. And I can build upon that. And then eventually that gets to the point of being able to participate in the life of the church, even when you have remaining questions and doubts. So I am curious, how do you go about believing something or how do you go about? So let's let's get down to the, the title, the little catchy title of your book, right? How do you be a Christian and not believe that it's true, right? I mean, I imagine that has to be all of the pushback that you would would get would be this idea that it's like, how can I not just be dishonest with myself at that point? Like, am, or, or, because I get the sense that you're not trying to tell people to lie to themselves. You're trying to tell them, but if you're not telling them to lie to themselves, how can they be a Christian, but believe that it's false? So you could, one way to think about this is to begin to work backwards uh, and start with a particular confession or creed. So let's say, for example, the Westminster Confession of Faith. Let's say that you mm -hmm. you want to be part of a Reformed Christian community that confesses the Westminster Confession of Faith, and that's several pages long. Um, and I know I have friends. I have one, for example, one friend who he teaches at a Reformed university, a Calvinist university, where you have to assent to the Westminster Confession of Faith. One of the things in the Westminster Confession of Faith is belief that the Pope is the Antichrist. Um, and so when, when he was hired at that school, one of the things he had to say is that's one that I don't accept. And they allowed him to have that exception and still assent to most, the vast majority of the confession and be part of their community. And so when, when we talk about, well, do you believe it's true? What we're talking about actually is a long diverse set of individual truth claims. Mm -hmm. So one of the places to start is to say, uh, well, exactly which of these truth claims do you have to assent to in order to be a Christian? So that's one thing to keep in mind. Uh, it's actually much more, it's not binary. It's not, do you believe it or not? Well, no, there's a whole list of, of claims that constitute Christianity. So if you're going to say, well, you have to believe them, all of them, like every last one of them, uh, do I have to believe believer's baptism uh, to be a Christian? Or can I be agnostic? Or can I be <laughs> pedo-baptistic, et cetera? So, so that's complicated, actually. The other thing that I would add to that as well is there's also the question of degree of belief. Okay. So it's it's one thing to have a very uh, belief, but it's sort of a tepid belief. It's another thing to have a very strong belief. So it it's not enough necessarily to check a box on a survey. Um, there may be something more that is required. Uh, think about Jesus saying to Peter, get out of the boat, right? And mm -hmm. walk on the water. Uh, it's one thing to say, wow, look, Jesus can walk on the water. I bet he could make us walk on the water too. It's another thing to believe that in the way that would allow you to get out of the boat. And I actually give some uh, interesting illustrations of that in the book. So um, it's complicated. Again, it's not only do you believe, you know, what is the full list of things you have to believe? It's also with what degree of conviction mm -hmm. such that it impacts your action. Do you have to believe those things that you confess? And that is complicated. So the, the one thing I would want to say to people is be cautious about saying, well, you have to believe Christianity is true in order to become a Christian, because now you're going to have to give further clarity as to what precisely you have to believe and with what degree of conviction you have to believe it.
So in a sense, really, you're just kind of telling the doubter to pursue it to the extent that they do understand and believe and kind of allow it to be a journey, right? It's more of a a spectrum and a journey that somebody is kind of going along in their understanding and development. Kind of like, I mean, honestly, I think a lot of Christians would agree. We all kind of have our own individual journey in journeys through sanctification and we change our theological positions over time and and things like that i mean i wouldn't say that i believe half the things you know i did 10 years ago right so um yeah yeah i I can i I mean i i came from a conversionist tradition so i grew up pentecostal and in that tradition it's out of the holiness and conversionist tradition the idea is you have to know the day that you were saved in order to really be sure that you're saved Mm. Uh, now I would not accept that anymore, but that's the framework I was raised with. And so when I was like four or five years old, my parents had a conversation with me and said, you've got to choose you're gonna, whether you're going to follow God or the devil. I was like, oh, think thought about that for the afternoon. And then I chose Jesus over Satan, um, which in retrospect, that's a, I think was that's a, a good choice. It's a good choice. But uh, I remember saying to my mom before I made the decision, I don't want anybody mad at me. Like, I don't want, why can't I be friends with both of them? And they said, no, you got to choose. So I look back at that and I think, what was my theology when I was four or five years old? I mean, Mm -hmm. there was no theology to speak of. I didn't know who I was praying to or what those prayers meant. And for the last 45 years, I've been growing into the meaning and significant and implications of those prayers. Mm -hmm. So we are all on a journey of theological understanding. Just to to give one more illustration, uh, when my daughter was, was young, Remember that she said to me once, how high can you count? And I thought, well, I guess 999 trillion, et cetera. Because I wasn't sure. I'm still not sure actually what comes yeah. after trillion. It doesn't come up with me on a, in regular conversation. So then she said, well, I can count to 19. And she was really proud of herself. <laughs> and I kind of laughed at her, not inside. Yeah. Because I thought the enormous difference between 19 and 999 trillion. But then you think, yeah, but 999 trillion set against an infinite a series of integers is like inconsequential, the difference between that and nine and 19. So it just puts in a perspective how inadequate all of our theologies are with respect to the divine. And so that's something I think we all need to keep in mind. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's good advice. And it's, it's funny. Um, I can think of a couple stories. The, um, I don't know if you remember, there was a story about a pastor who decided that he wanted to live like an atheist for a year. Yes. Um, right. And, and remember how that turned out? he converts in the end to atheism. Yeah. And, and it reminds me a lot of exactly what you're talking about here, because a lot of people were like, nobody, a lot of Christians that I know weren't really surprised. They're like, if you live like an atheist, why would you expect to be like that? And I guess that's to some degree, it's like, Hey, live like a Christian and allow your faith to grow in a sense. I guess it's kind of this notion of something like that. That sound right. I remember that that story that his fellow, the name, his name was Ryan Bell. And, uh, and yeah, you are kind of thinking like, if you're gonna, if you're already at the point of living like an atheist, what does that say? It's kind of like uh, the husband who says, Hey, why don't we try this whole open marriage (laughs) for a year? And you're like, okay, this marriage is already toast at that point. So it's a similar situation, but yeah, you can flip that around. If you say, Hey, uh, why don't you try living like a Christian? Well, then, at least that very much increases the likelihood that you will find yourself holding the beliefs that you desire. And that, while you can't make yourself believe something, that is something you can do. You can will to be a part of a community at a particular level of participation. Maybe it's just showing up Sunday morning and listening to the service uh, and and singing and, and listening to the sermon. Maybe you can't take communion. Maybe you can't take membership. Maybe you can't Although I, I would say most churches are welcome to to accept volunteers, even with various doubts and questions, sure. there are all sorts of things you can do. You can go to the men's group or the women's group and so on, and you can begin to participate in the life of the church. And that will, I think, all things being equal, increase the likelihood that you'll move further into Christian community and, and identity. I, I have a friend and he used to have a quote. He said, you can't choose who you fall in love with, but you can choose who you spend your time with. And so that was his kind of point was like, if you just choose to spend more time with someone, then it does increase your chances of falling in love with them. Yeah. And so, so I I am curious then. um, So 
Now, because you actually, uh, you started this with this idea of you like, well, you can't choose your beliefs. You can't choose your beliefs, but you do believe you can impact them then. Is that right? We can, we can certainly impact our beliefs. I mean, I can, I can impact my belief on what's outside the hall uh, of my office in the hallway right now by walking outside. I can will <laughs> to walk outside. Yeah. I can't control what I will ultimately see there and thus what beliefs I will form, but I can have all sorts of impact on my beliefs. And it's the same when it comes to Christianity. Uh, yeah. So, so these things like begin to love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, this, the second chapter I would submit is maybe the most interesting one in the book, because I argue there that people who are atheists uh, can nonetheless begin to strive to love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, uh, which I think is an interesting one. But I do think it's true that that if you believe there is something beyond nature that is absolute and the source of goodness and value, as some atheists do, but they believe it's impersonal, I believe that they can begin to love that reality and then maybe come to the point where they recognize that reality is personal and, in fact, loves them and cares for them. And so I think that there are all sorts of things that you can begin to do even now while you doubt, while you question. One other thing I just want to throw in there is that I think doubts and questions are healthy, mm -hmm. both for individuals and for communities. And so we should stop problematizing them all the time and thinking, uh, it's actually, here's an analogy. I mean, for, for years, there was this obsession about hygiene, right? And that you have to keep your kids as clean as possible. Dirt is always the enemy. Yeah, yeah. Pets are the enemy. Keep them away from nuts and other things that might be allergens and so on. Increasingly, the the idea is, no, we need to expose children to, to dirt. We need to expose them to pets and dander and other things. And that actually builds their immune system. Um, and then same thing with the playgrounds. This, there's this philosophy for a long time that we need to move towards safe playgrounds. But now, now there's an increasing move back to adventure playgrounds that can be actually quite dangerous. But the interesting thing is that children regulate their play with the environments that they are in. So um, this is true. If if um, some people are like they they do like a playground that includes like nails and hammers and wood, and you're like, are you crazy? That is a recipe for disaster. But children tend to regulate their own risk assessment with respect to the environments they're in, and overall, those playgrounds. And this is the data that I've seen tend to have less fewer injuries than the ultra safe playgrounds that we tried to create. And I think that there's something there analogous to the way that we've thought about doubt. Mm -hmm. that we have to secure ourselves, inoculate ourselves and our communities yeah. from any yeah. doubt or any questioning that could be subversive. And I think actually the opposite is the case. No, you know what? Actually, I think that right there is a brilliant point. And it's actually one that I was really just looking at um, adding into some apologetics materials. Um, I was explaining to some other people, like as you grow in Christian faith and as you teach faith to your children, the, a lot of the ones that I've seen that have really struggled are those that grow up in these sterile environments, right? Where they're completely sheltered from the outside world. And in fact, I actually just heard um, a story. I was talking to a mom and she has nine kids and she was just talking about how her two oldest have left the faith, right? And it was a very stereotypical story. It was the story of they were grown up homeschooled and they went to college and one year of college and the professors beat the religion right out of them. Yeah. Right. Um, but it's exactly for a lot of the reasons that you're talking about was they were never put in that environment to question, to allow, to be free, to have doubts and, and those sorts of things. And I remember taking an intro to philosophy class. <laughs> And uh, since you're very familiar with philosophy and have done a lot of that, one of the things that I really appreciated from our professor was he would take you through this whole argument. And by the end of the class, you know, he's about convinced everyone that this is true. And then he cuts it to pieces, right? Cuts it to pieces and destroys it. And it's like, oh, and then everyone's kind of going like, oh, so I guess that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And I think there is so much truth in, and it's exactly what I've explained to a couple of them is like, I think you need to show your kids arguments for Christianity and then destroy them. Like at least some for exactly that reason to show it's like, well, what does it mean if an argument for Christianity fails? Well, it just means that belief is fails. Right. But I think that builds what you're saying and it helps inoculate them into going like, Oh, my beliefs aren't monolithic. Right. It's not like, Oh, if one single belief in Christianity, crumbles or one thing that I believed, one aspect of theology fails, then the whole faith fails, right? So you kind yeah. of segmented a little bit more. 
one of the illustrations I sometimes use, and I always want to be cautious about it because I'm going to explain in a moment that it has some significant limitations, but I think it's also useful, is the uh, vaccine, a vaccine. I don't want to get okay. into the whole, whole, whole <laughs> yeah, the vaccine yeah. thing. But let's Way just to say hit a hot button topic, Randall. Yeah, let's just say your annual flu shot, okay? Uh, most people think, yeah, flu shot, this is the thing, is the flu shots I've never promised to be 100% effective, but they do tend to, to diminish the severity of disease. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's say that uh, the value of a flu shot is it introduces you to a small bit of the disease, uh, an expression of it, and familiarizes or allows your immune system to familiarize itself with that disease. So if it encounters the pathogen later, it can respond more effectively to it. Mm -hmm. And I think in many cases, what we can think about is exposing people to doubts and questions and problems is a way of just giving in a controlled environment, like in, in a vaccine, it's giving a, in a controlled environment just a little taste of the kind of things that you're going to experience out there in the big, scary world. Yeah. So that when you do encounter them in those environments, you're not overcome with disease, as it were. Your faith isn't destroyed or something. You're completely deconstructed. Now, I said I wanted to, um, I said this was a limited analogy. So the danger of it is that it simply presents all of the counter evidence to your current beliefs as pathogenic. And that is a danger because I think we have to always keep in mind that we don't know everything, that we are always learning. And many of the things that are going to challenge our faith as it currently exists do so for good reason, because we've got something wrong and we need to rethink that. So we shouldn't think it's all pathogenic. It's all like a flu that we need to protect ourselves mm. from. I think in many cases, we need to learn from it. So I think it's all about that balance, is that um, what the vaccine, as it were, can do is expose you in a controlled environment to the existential questioning and doubt and uncertainty you will experience, but also try to keep an open mind to the evidence that is contrary to your current beliefs uh, so that you can recognize as objectively as possible where you may need to revise what you think. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. There, there, there is a degree of healthy uh, deconstruction on some levels, right? Because we don't know everything, right? And um, yeah, on occasion, I've been accused of being a deconstructionist, but I'm only trying to deconstruct things that I think are wrong, right? True. You, so you have to allow a little bit of that flexibility in. Otherwise, yeah, you, if you don't allow anything in, then yeah, it ends up being like even more dangerous and deadly <laughs> to some effect, right? So that yeah. that's actually also an, an interesting point where, yeah, just kind of allowing little bits in, but trying not to, yeah, push out or recognize all all pathogens bad, I guess, or something like that. I, I wrote, a few years ago, I wrote a book called Conversations with My Inner Atheist. And so I, I my inner atheist, I called her, Mia. I anthropomorphized this, mm -hmm. these doubts and questions I have as a person. And I had a dialogue throughout the book on various issues of Christianity with my inner atheist. And I think that is a healthy exercise for each one of us is to say, what's your inner doubter say? Because uh, mm -hmm. we often don't want to listen to those doubts. We want to quash them. We want to silence them. But they may have something pretty important for us to say. Again, a another analogy, not unlike pain in the body. If you're like, I'm not going to listen to that pain and that pain keeps getting worse. Yeah. Or that that knocking under the engine, uh, under the hood of your car engine. Uh, if you don't address that eventually, you know, you're going to be left stranded on the side of the road. Yeah, no, that that's, that's actually really, uh, that's really good advice. So I, I am curious, like, wow, like, um, well, I, I'm curious, like a lot of authors have all, all talked about. So dialogue with your inner atheist. Did you feel like you got more out of it than, than maybe the readers even did? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it depends <laughs> on how readers, readers seem to like the book. But uh, I mean, for me, it's, it's not an existential struggle. So uh, for some people it is, and it can be scary. Yeah. Like I'm pretty comfortable in my skin. I'm pretty comfortable with my belief. I've been thinking about belief and doubt and apologetics and evidence and systematic theology for more than 30 years and more than 20 years as a, as a professor. So I'm comfortable with, with these things. Yeah. Uh, but, but I think it's, it's healthy for everybody to be questioning and exploring and always recognizing that you need to continue to grow. I love the story of uh, Thomas Aquinas I think it was December 6, uh, 1273, when he went to church and he had a mystical experience. And then afterwards, he said that he would write no more theology because all that he has written is as straw. And this mm -hmm. is uh, 
the greatest theologian of the Middle Ages, probably the greatest theologian since Augustine in the fourth and fifth centuries. So he's a hugely impactful figure. And if Thomas Aquinas said that everything he wrote is a straw, you can imagine what it says for the rest of us. <laughs> yeah. But it's just a nice reminder that we are not saved by our theology. We're saved by relationship with God and Jesus Christ. And I think that should give all of us space and safety to be able to question and explore as we seek to understand him better. No, I... And um, yeah, so so like for myself, I, I went through when I was younger, I kind of went through my own existential crisis. Um, um, I kind of I had a period of kind of wondering and testing things. And then a um, little bit later on in my early 20s, you know, the new athe new wave of atheism came around. And at the time, I was very much a rationalist, like just it was everything about what I could think and understand in my head. And so I was out to answer every possible objection under the sun. And at some point, I mean, it was literally just, you know, I'm, I'm chasing my own tail. Like, I mean, because there's always like this next question and the next question and the next question. Mm -hmm. And I'm literally just getting tired and exhausted. And um, it was only after, yeah, I finally kind of reached that level of mm, being comfortable in my own skin and coming to that connection very much more a personal connection in some ways with Jesus and finding the foundation that I felt like free to, to explore, to doubt, to ask questions and not worry about it. Cause those questions didn't wreck my whole life. But um, so I'm curious, what kind of advice do you have for the person who basically says, I deeply want Christianity to be true. I love the idea of Jesus. I love what it sounds like he represents. I love how he treats people, but I just don't, I can't get over, I'll use a more practical example. I can't get over how the church and Christians have treated me. Yeah, I, I'd say <laughs> just, uh tweeted yesterday i posted a tweet uh where i said uh, people who give up on the church because they had a bad experience with a christian community like their local congregation that's like giving up on eating because you got food poisoning at a restaurant <laughs> uh, because you know from a christian perspective you you need the community as much as from a gastronomic perspective, you need food for your body to survive. Um, but I understand that people, that they've had toxic experiences with churches. Mm -hmm. I mean, I deal with that all the time. And I mean, some of them, you know, we're, we're you know, things like the sex abuse scandal in the Catholic church yeah. or the Me Too scandals with the Southern Baptists of late. I mean, yeah. the church has always been a grossly, egregiously flawed institution. Uh, and there are some people for them, maybe church is a trigger word. You know, there was, there was, I, I read through the attorney general's report, uh, for in the state of Pennsylvania a few years ago, when they did an investigation of the Catholic, uh, clergy sex abuse scandals, and they interviewed over a thousand adults who were once children who had been sexually abused over 40 years, just in Pennsylvania by priests. Mm. And one of them uh, that, that I'll never forget what she said, she said, whenever I hear the word God, I think of him referring to the priest. Mm -hmm. So you're thinking, wow, that it doesn't get more toxic than that. And so in the most extreme cases, there may be people for whom Christianity is itself or the Christian community or the church is a trigger. And they can't even begin at that point, at that basic level. To, to move closer to Christian belief. But they can, I think, at least, even if you can't go to the, the level of finding a community, you can find individuals mm -hmm. who are good people. Uh, and here I think of a story that Chuck Colson told some years ago. So Chuck Colson, uh, he died a few years, several years ago now, but he was actually a, a, a lawyer in the White House during uh, Richard Nixon's administration. And he went to prison uh, because of the whole scandal. Uh, and then he became a Christian and he wrote a best-selling book called Born Again, I think, in 1976. And then he founded uh, 
uh, international prison ministries, where he, uh, it was a ministry devoted to helping people in prison. That's the background. So then Chuck Colson would tell the story that there was an American man and his son was backpacking through Australia and he got into trouble with the law and he was arrested and put in jail. And his father felt so helpless back in America that he called uh, uh, Chuck Colson's prison ministries um, ministry. And they happened to have someone in the city named Malcolm in the city in Australia where this young man was in, in jail. And so that guy went down and he met with the young man in jail and he talked to the police and he and he helped them through that situation. And that man then said, I used to have nothing to do with the church. And I always thought that the church was this. If you said, what is the church? I would have said, well, it's that building down the street. And he said, but after that experience, I would have said the church is a man named Malcolm. And so the first thing I would want to say to people is if you are at the point of your Christianity has been so toxic for you that you can't even think of being uh, joining or visiting a Christian church, find a Christian person, a good person that you can mm -hmm. begin to build a relationship with and go from there. Uh, for others, uh, they can just be be part of the church. And I mean, I would say I, I, for, for those people, you said, what do they do? Well, I wrote the book, The Doubter's Creed to guide them through that process. So that would be the mm -hmm. place where I would direct them for a, a fuller overview. And one thing the book provides is, is successive creeds of, of further complexity and detail that they can agree to. So even if you can't assent to the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed or the Westminster Confession, maybe you can just say, hey, I'm going to love my neighbor and look upon Jesus as an exemplar in doing that. That's fantastic. Start there. Mm -hmm. And then that's the the journey that I would invite people to embark upon. Yeah. So you you almost seem like you have created baby steps of creeds. Is that, is that sound so, yeah. about right? Yeah. You've kind of have this stepping block. It's like, hey, like, you know, let's, you know, whatever. You're at level one, like kind of start here with the simple creed. And then like, maybe you finally get to level two and you're like, be able to accept a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. Is that kind of the idea? That seems it, like a very yeah. novel idea. I've, I've never heard of anyone creating anything like that, but. Yeah, if, yeah. if you look on the cover of the book, you'll see a mountain image uh, and this, uh, a mountain climber looking in awe at having to climb that mountain. So in the beginning of the book, I actually borrow an illustration from Richard Dawkins, uh, climbing Mount okay. Improbable. Uh, Dawkins used it within the context of evolution. He says, uh, creationists say that you can't create the diversity of life forms on Earth through slow successive steps of evolution because they look at the, the structures as they now exist and they're way up there on the top of Mount Improbable and there's this huge cliff that you can never get from the bottom to the top. And he says, but if we go around the back, there's a more gentle gradient slope and we can walk up the slope to, to the top of the mountain. Now, whether or not you think that that works with mm -hmm. respect to evolution, uh, that's the illustration that I borrow with respect to creeds. Mm -hmm. So you come to Christianity and you're like, wow, the Apostles' Creed, that's like this, this mountain peak and I can never scale that. I can never believe that. Yeah, but why don't you come around the back and work up the slope? And those are the creeds, almost like, camps up the side of the mountain in the back so you can begin to love your neighbor you can begin to love god as an impersonal absolute and you can begin to work from there and then you can participate in the life of the church at the degree to which you are able and eventually i think you can be really get quite far up the mountain by doing things even though you can't mm -hmm. control your beliefs yeah you know and, and and honestly um i'm also you know uh tony robbins you ever heard of him yeah, yeah. One of the, he he actually says something similar that kind of reminds me of this. He says, you know what? Motion creates emotion. And and so part of his whole point is is exactly that. It's like if you want to change something, you want to do something, he's like, get into motion and that'll help shift and change the inside. And so I guess some of this is kind of what it reminds me of that a little bit. It's like, hey, why don't you start by actually just doing activities, participating, being a part of a community group, being a part of a church, getting connected with a friend, having conversations. And then, you know what, your insides might start to respond to how you're living, how you're doing life on the outside. So you're mm -hmm. kind of trying to use the outside to train the inside a little bit, right? Yeah, yeah that's fair. So, um, with all of this, and you're, you're kind of building, a, you know, one of the other things that it's my kind of understanding about you in general is that uh, you were very much 
you you would do a good job of trying to keep the tension or pull the tension in between experience and intellectual honesty and and all those things does that sound right or yeah for sure um i i I mean intellectual honesty is big that uh i i don't think that we should be scared of any question and i think if if we do have doubts we need to recognize them um so i think that that's I mean, there is that saying, all truth is God's truth. I mean, it's mm-hmm. often attributed to Arthur Holmes. I'm sure many people have said it. But we don't have to be afraid of truth. And if there is some aspect of our beliefs now that is wrong, we should want to know that. I, I once gave an illustration in, in another book about how sometimes people are not ready to confront the questions and doubts that they have. And I said, this is the kind of uh, absurd illustration. If you were like driving... Let's say you're you're driving in in eastern Colorado, and you want to uh, go to get to Kansas City eventually, which is east. Uh, But then you see, it looks like mountains in the distance are appearing on the horizon, and then they're getting larger. And you say, wow, it sure looks like I'm going west, uh, like I'm going in the wrong direction. But if you say, no, I'm I'm not going to acknowledge what I'm seeing on the horizon, I'm just going to keep driving in that direction that would be absurd, right? What you have to do is pull over and look at your map, uh, look, pull at your GPS. I guess I'm a little dated when I said, look at your map, <laughs> look at your GPS, uh, get directions from somebody to a gas station, because it sure looks, the evidence is accruing that you're going toward the mountains, not toward Kansas City. And and I think that sometimes people respond to the growing evidence against their own beliefs by speeding up the car toward the mountains, uh, which I think is like a short-term defensive mechanism, but it's not going to be good in the long term. Yeah, yeah. No, that's um, that's that's good. So I, I, I guess I have a slightly different question, which which would be this: What would you say to the believer or the individual who intellectually accepts the creeds or these notions, but their struggle is the opposite? They're basically saying. I accept the creeds, but I just feel like their insides feel like God doesn't exist. Like intellectually, they're like, it all makes sense and whatever they've bought on to whatever apologetic arguments, but they're just like, I feel like there is no experience of God in my life. And it, he just doesn't, let's just say they are just like, he doesn't feel real to me. One thing that that I I would say is is here, too, we often cultivate problems unnecessarily through expectation. In this case, the expectation that for your faith to be a living one, it has to be one where you're experiencing God every day in some particular way. And that is certainly not the case. Um, It's the same thing, again, when it comes back to my conversionist tradition. Mm-hmm. So we always ex- we always focused upon conversion as validating the current life of the Christian. I know I was a Christian because I was saved on this day. And then you add into that narrative, the more dramatic the narrative, uh, the more... Um, the more saved you were, in a the sense. The more saved you were, the more it is validated, the <laughs> right, more confidence right. you can have. So for example, like if you say, I prayed the sinner's prayer and... I felt the arms of heaven wrap around me and the <laughs> dam broke and the tears flowed down. And suddenly my shorter left limb grew and was now the same <laughs> length as my right limb. And I could walk again and I no longer had headaches and I was no longer an alcoholic. And you're like, wow. Cause when I became a Christian, all that happened was I prayed this in his prayer and nothing changed. Yeah. We went to lunch. <laughs> we yep. went to lunch. Yeah. And, and it's like, I mean, I don't want to ever diminish those amazing stories. They're great. The only problem comes when we think that has to be my story. Yeah. And so it's the same thing if a person's like, yeah, but I don't feel like, I mean, I believe it, but it, it's not alive to me. I mean, there was in the in the conversionist holiness tradition, there were a lot of people in existential dread over that very issue. John Wesley, for example, mm-hmm. he was like tortured when he met um, pietists on, on, the, on the boat uh, when he was going to America and they had this living faith in the midst of a storm. And he said, I have a, I've been a Christian all my life, but I don't have that. And so it wasn't until he felt his heart strangely warmed at Aldersgate that he said, now I know I'm a Christian. I don't want to diminish Wesley's experience, but I also don't want to think that that is an expectation for us. Mm-hmm. So I think that we have to be careful about 
making these demands. And I grew up Pentecostal, so I know what that's about. Because we said, if you're truly spirit baptized, you will speak in tongues. Yep. And that's just another way to set people up for unnecessary crises of faith. But very, very careful about generalizing our experience to everybody. Yeah, no, I think that's that's really great advice, you know, because everyone is different. And yeah, it's certainly the case that individuals have very different experiences with God and and things like that. And, you know, we're, we don't all have the same expectations or same callings for sure, for sure. Yeah. So um, I'm curious then, um, yeah, what would be your biggest admonition for the Christian who has been a Christian for 20 years, 25 years, and their biggest thing is they've been holding in secret doubts, right? So they've been holding in their secret doubts and they just, they don't want to tell anyone because they do, they go to that church. They go to that church that, you know, if they bring it up to the pastor, the pastor's response is you just need to have more faith, or maybe you never got saved or, you know, the criticisms will just fly in from left and right. And mom and dad will disown you and all that stuff. Yeah. I, I would, first thing I would say is that some of those people may even need to get honest with themselves. Mm -hmm. There are some people who can't even be honest with themselves about the degree to which they have doubts and questions. Um, but for others, yeah, they, they're very much aware of them and they're festering. Um, I guess the first thing there I would say is it's not good to carry those burdens alone. So find mm -hmm. people you can share with. Um, my church is a very healthy church and I would, I don't think there'd be any stigma in sharing doubts in a small group or something sure. like that. If if you are in a church where where you're terrified at the prospect of that, that may not be a church that you should be in long term, um, mm. and you may it may be best for you at this time to find a church where you are safe. You know, in in the workplace, uh, I, I I do some work outside of theology and being a professor in workplace safety, mm -hmm. and so we talk about a psychologically safe workplace. And one of the aspects of a psychologically safe workplace is where you feel safe to disagree with the manager or the administrator, whoever you report to, and to other higher ups, you feel safe to share a different perspective from them without fearing that you will be recriminated against or you face retribution. And there are a lot of people that don't have that, that they don't feel safe in their work environment, that they mm -hmm. feel if they do disagree with their boss, uh, that there will be repercussions. And there are a lot of churches like that too, sadly, right? If, if mm -hmm. you say, you know, I have questions and doubts about this, then there could be a stigma that comes. So I would say uh, if you don't feel safe, you may have to find a different church. Or, or, or at least an individual, least, like you were saying. Yeah, right? or at least an individual that you can share with and, and begin that journey. But don't be afraid of truth, right? And don't be afraid of questioning and don't be afraid of doubts. Uh, recognize that, I mean, doubts are part of the Christian life. Martin Luther, right? Martin Luther, when I was growing up as a Protestant, well, Martin Luther was this guy who had all these doubts and then he had his tower experience and he discovered the doctrine of justification by faith and he never had another doubt. That's not true. Martin Luther wrestled with doubts and questions about his own salvation throughout his life. Philip Melanchthon, mm -hmm. his younger contemporary at Wittenberg, describes Luther as being wrapped up in the fetal position for hours at a time sometimes, uh, crying out about uh, the... the uh, whether he was part of God's benevolent decree of salvation. So he had doubts. Or you think about Mar uh, Mother Teresa, right? She was, here's someone who labored throughout her life in seeking to love her neighbor as herself. And after her death, when her journals were published, uh, there's all these doubts. She's even questioning whether God exists in her journals. But she didn't let that incapacitate her from living out the Christian life. So I think once we recognize how many other people doubt uh, then you can have hopefully that stigma lifted when you have doubts as well. Yeah. And I, I guess along that, I, I, it, to me, it also sounds like, you know, it's, it is, it's very healthy to share in in small groups and that's part of the, I'll, I'll put it this way. Right. I've been a part of like some groups where like a lot of people are there to help kind of confess the sins and the struggles they're going through. Right. And usually after the first couple guys, you know, go ahead and lay out something big that everybody else opens up. And I think mm -hmm. it's exactly that reason that, you know what, everybody, there are so many people that are all having doubts. And the only reason that they feel like they're the only one is because nobody else is sharing any of those in public sometimes. 
I, I remember a, a cartoon of um of a student in a large classroom in like a first year university course. And he's like has a little thought bubble above him and he's thinking, uh, I don't understand what the professor just said. And then it it expands to the whole class and everybody's thinking the same thought. Uh, it says, but if I say something, everyone else will think I'm stupid. Yeah. So yeah. Like, nobody <laughs> understood, but nobody's willing to be the one to say, hey, I didn't get that because then everyone will think they're stupid. No, everybody will be like, oh, I'm glad he asked. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah. Often we don't recognize how many other people have doubts and questions. Yep, yep, yep. No, I find that to be tremendously true. Yep. Well, Dr. Rouser, uh, thank you so much for everything. I greatly appreciate it. Um, I am curious uh, as well, like, um, yeah, so where where is it that everyone can find you? I'll be happy to post your your links in the description. And um... Right. Where? Well, you can find me in my office right now. I'll be at home later on this morning. Okay, that's like a dad <laughs> joke in a yeah. level. Um, sorry. Um, yes, you, I'm online, randallrouser.com, uh, on Twitter uh, with my name. And you can find my books on Amazon and other fine booksellers. Uh, so it's been great being with you, Adam. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks so much for for sharing with us and just helping, yeah, helping people to overcome the doubts that they have, rather they're striving for Christianity or have been in for many years. So yep, hope for hopefully we'll yeah talk to you soon and um, yeah, God bless you and your your work. Yeah, you too. Thanks. <laughs>